I'll make a start. I've already been to the university for, um, for one discussion, so he's met a number of my colleagues. Um, but it's great that he's uh, decided to uh, move out of the industry in London and take a role in Manchester as the artistic director for film at home, which is uh, Manchester's major new contemporary arts venue, theatre, five cinema screens, music, a great bar, great restaurant. Um, I don't want to oversell the home. It is in Manchester, obviously. I'll, so I'll pay you afterwards, <laughs> Roger. <laughs> um, but Jason um, is also a professor of film at Manchester Met University. He's got over 20 years of experience in the UK film industry and a strong affiliation with the cultural independent sector. Before moving to home, he uh, was the programme manager at Picture House, and uh, director of programming at Curzon Cinemas and took responsibility at Artificial Eye, which is one of the UK's leading art house distributors for movies such as Pina, Evil, The Deep Blue Sea, Archipelago and The Duke of Burgundy. And these are some of the titles of movies by the directors, some of the directors that he interviews in his book. Um, he has curated retrospectives as a programme of Peter Whitehead, Atom McGoin, famous Canadian director, Vin Vendors, Chris Pettit, Nicholas Rogue, and Mexican cinema. And he served as a jury member of a number of um, festival award-giving juries, such as at London and also in Brighton. He's co-directed three documentaries and is the author of 10 published works on cinema. And he writes for The Guardian, Sight and Sound, Vertigo, and So Film. I hardly recognise the person that you've described. That actually sounds quite good. I'm, I'm quite... I made it up. Did yeah, I write that? Yeah. Is that? I made it up, yeah. <laughs> I employed a really good screenwriter <laughs> yeah. to pull that together. Um, so, uh, before we get talking about your book, um, could you um, tell us a bit about the kinds of... a bit more in detail about the kinds of roles that you did with um, Picture House and also with the distributor, Artificial Life? Yeah. Um, well, as... as Roger Carney reminded you all, uh, I've actually been working in the film industry for 23 years. Um, and, I mean, Roger and I met through a, a guy called Tony Jones, and Tony Jones is a bit of a powerhouse in independent cinema. And Tony founded Picture House Cinemas, uh, which were then known as City Screen. And Tony was a kind of iconoclastic figure. He was only really interested in independent film. Um, he, he wanted to kind of break new filmmakers, um, in a good way, not not break them, break their spirit, <laughs> break them to uh, break them out to audiences. Um, and Tony was very resistant to just play Hollywood films to make money. He want, he would rather play an independent or foreign language or specialised film. Um, and while he controlled the company, he was allowed to do that. But then at some point, venture capitalism came into the picture, and Picture House was sold. Uh, and Tony's preference for playing um, Hungarian goat herding movies over um, X-Men <laughs> soon caught up with him. So I was kind of trained by, by Tony and, and, I, and I was brought in to program uh, the Duke of York's Brighton. don't know if any of you have been to the Duke of York's Brighton. Um, but primarily a cinema which was called the Metro, uh, which was formerly known as the Other Cinema, which everybody says is the worst cinema name ever. Mm -hmm. um, but the Other Cinema... Tony Kirkhope Cinema. Tony Kirkhope Cinema. And it was a very, very famous cinema because it was a very, very radical left-wing cinema um, which showed very very political films um, and Tony just kind of brought me in with no training and just threw me in and he made me go to all these kind of socialist co-op meetings and um, and convince people that I, I wasn't going to bring in James Bond, James Bond movies um, and once I convinced them I, I was allowed to live um, but you know these were the, we, we, we showed films like Born in Flames the Lizzie Bowden film which are really radical American independent film we showed Wanda by uh, Barbara Loden, which is, um, you know, all these kind of masterpieces of lost cinema. John Cassavetes, we did a, a Cassavetes season, and Peter Whitehead, who you mentioned. Um, you know, kind of leftist, radicalist filmmaking. Um, and it was where I first encountered the films of Chris Pettit. We did a reissue of Chris Pettit's Radio On, which, if anybody ever asks me, is my favourite film of all time. So that was kind of what I was interested in. And, and then without speaking ill of, of my old company, Picture House, as many of these companies did, they began to take a more and more mainstream approach. Um, you know, they started to show more and more films from Hollywood. They showed less and less independent films. 
uh, and for me the writing was on the wall and so I received an offer to go to Curzon um, who also had a distribution arm called Artificial Eye who released many of the mm -hmm. films that you mentioned and went back to 1976 another iconoclastic figure called Andy Engel um, and I was given the chance to come in and, and, and kind of run those cinemas and also help choose some of the films and it was a great kind of five years but then unfortunately again without wishing to speak ill of anybody uh, whilst speaking ill of them of course Curzon then also mm -hmm. began to show more and more mainstream mm -hmm. films and, and that's just not what I'm interested in. And the company that he mentions Picture House is the company that programs the movies at fact programs and in a loose sense well, i think yeah, yeah but also operates the cinemas at, at fact yeah um and what was i mean for you what's the the attraction of working um within what you could call the indie sec sector rather than you know progress through the ranks and become you know a programming consultant at cineworld or view or the odeon yeah it's just it's just not my i mean i studied i was the first um to show my age, I was the first generation to do a film studies A level in the UK, um, and I had a cinephile brother who used to take me. In fact, the first film I ever saw in a cinema was Radio On when I was 13. And my brother, I remember my brother sneaking me into the cinema under his coat. I mean, most brothers were being taken to see Disney films or Star Wars. I was taken to see Radio On, um, and it just kind of stuck, you know. And it's very easy to make very very subjective comments about. There's nothing wrong with Hollywood filmmaking, it just is never, and also we don't want to be too pejorative, but it's, it's just never really been the thing that's interested me. I mean, um, my sister used to work for um, Pearl and Dean. I remember she got tickets to, to the Star Wars. Da -da, da -da, yeah, exactly. Da -da, da -da, da -da, uh, and yeah. she got tickets to Star Wars because our family dog was in an advert for Allied Carpets, which was used. <laughs> anyway, so I went to see Star Wars, <laughs> and I, I was just... I, you know, this might be a heinous thing. So I was bored, rigid. Mm. You know, I've just never been interested in that kind of filmmaking. But, but th those companies, such as um, Picture House and Curzon, had, as you were describing them, um, radical roots in providing uh, independent exhibition and distribution, say, in the sort of 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Yeah. But they're now functioning almost as mini um, multiplex in some sense, aren't they? Yeah. So well you can we turn to that in a minute, but sure. it just shows how the um, the, pro the process of exhibition and distribution has, has very much dr dramatically changed in, in the UK. Yeah, and I think that's a prob possibly, a, I mean, I know you mentioned about me coming to, I think that's possibly a London-based issue. I mean, one of the problems that is, is London and the South, actually, is that, that, that cinema ticket prices are so expensive because rents are so expensive. And so... You know, the average ticket price in the West End and, and is, is 15 to 22 pounds. Now, most people can't afford mm. to, to pay that. And it's very difficult to expect people to take a chance on a film they haven't seen when they're paying that sort of money. It's much easier to expect them to go and see Mad Max Fury Road, which I think was the most overrated film of, of last year. Of the Oscars. Personally. Well. Um, so, so, you know, in London, it became impossible to do this kind of programming. Now, when, when you also consider that all of the independent cinemas in London are either owned or operated by Curzon or Picture House, who now have a much more mainstream programme in Remit. There's the Barbican, which is independent, and most people men mention the ICA, which is independent, but the ICA is actually programmed by Picture House. There really wasn't anywhere to, and to go. And Cineworld owns Picture House now. Cineworld owns, owns Picture House. Yeah. So the, the mainstream has bought into the small boutique -y yeah, independent cinemas and is now either allowing them to flourish or perhaps alter them just, you know, in the long term. Well, I think Picture House, you know, Picture House sort of gesture towards independence. They, you know, what they do, they do a thing. I mean, how many people go to Picture House cinemas? Any of you? OK, a couple. They do a thing called Discover Tuesdays, which is where they play foreign language films. Now, when Tony and I were at Picture House... Every film was a you, Well, language, you could yeah. discover a foreign language film on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, yeah. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, not, not just yeah. on a Tuesday. On a Montag, Dean Stark. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and the thing is, you know, credit to Picture House, their models change. At least they're still showing yeah. the films. Mm -hmm. A lot of these other companies don't even show foreign language or specialised films anymore. And, and, and I think that we are involved in a kind of battle against this homogenisation of, of, of mainstream American film culture and I think it's great I think it's great that there are films like mm -hmm. Star Wars and but I don't think that's all there should mm -hmm. be 
Well, and I think that that's one of the challenges that we face as a cultural sector, that unless there are programmers and curators that stand up against that, that, that is all anybody's going to be able to see, and I, and, I, and I think that's wrong. Well, let me move on to your book and some of the themes in your book, because um, the, the directors that you write about are um, UK directors who um, in many ways are offering a, a, a counterblast to um, Hollywood type movies and also more conventional British movies. Um, I made a, a list myself of some of the directors. I don't know how you can read that writing. That is the worst <laughs> handwriting. Can I just look, look at this? Uh, you should be a doctor. I, I know, I know. That's what my mother wanted me to be, unfortunately. <laughs> She trained me to write like that. Um, in fact, that's a prescription for statins. Good, yeah. We'll get some of that on the, um, on the way back. So there's a, um, Jason's book is a series of interviews and commentaries about a whole group of UK independent directors who've um, come to um, prominence and attention within, say, the last, I'd say, five, six years or so. Yeah. And the, the, the argument that that he makes with Ian Hayden Smith, who's the co-writer, is that um, this group of directors uh, represents a new resurgence in the independent cinema spirits in the UK. So I, I made a list of those that, um, um, I, that I either know their movies or have got a professional connection with. And what was interesting was seeing some names there of UK indie directors who were also celebrated uh, on Sunday evening at the Oscars. So Lenny Abrahamson that you write about, he made the movie Adam and, Adam and Paul. Uh, he directed the movie Room, and the lead actor in that <coughs> won the best Larson. Dream, dream actor yep. uh, at the Oscars. There's Amma Asanta, who um, uh, a year ago, 18 months ago, had a movie called Bell released. Um, Richard Ioda, whose movie Submarine and The Double has um, yep. been on release. Cleo Bernard, um, who made The Arbor and then The Selfish Giant. Alex Garland, Ex Machina, and I think he had some Oscar nominations. Yes, well. that won an Oscar for um, special effects, I think. And um, I think the lead actress in that won another award but didn't win it for Ex Machina. Yeah, um, Alicia Vikander, she yeah. won for The Danish Girl, which yeah. is by far the worst film I saw last uh, year. Jonathan Glazer, whose uh, movie Under the Skin, a couple of years ago. I, I'm near the end of this short group, but there's a bigger group that you write about. Um, Carol Morley, um, Alcohol Years, Dreams of Life, The Falling. Asif Kapadia, uh, whose documentary Amy uh, won an Oscar for best, best documentary. Andrew Cotting, it was a director I think we, we both um, are particularly partial to. And then, of course, Steve McQueen, um, who was at the forefront of the Oscars last year, and uh, his movies in the last couple of years include Hunger, Shame, and 12 Years a Slave. So uh, we're not talking about a group of directors who are completely on the margins of, of independent cinema, because many of these film titles, will, most of us will, will probably clock onto or will know their name. Mm. Um, so we're talking about very uh, credible talents that have been um, uh, um, garlanded with awards culturally, but also their films have been um, generating probably reasonable commercial prospects. So um, what, what, what do you think um, is identifiable across them that makes, makes them a group that you would say represents new British cinema, which is title well I think I think that you know when people think of British cinema, I was trying to think I was thinking about this on the way over I think when people think of British cinema they tend to think of and you can correct me if I'm wrong they over t tend to think of kind of costume dramas um, period films period yeah. films um, or they tend to think of kind of films in the kind of social realist tradition the Ken Loach and um, Mike Lee both of whom are very good very good filmmakers and I think uh, as a kind of filmmaking fraternity, I think that, th and as a filmmaking culture, and as an industry, because we have to remember that film is an art, but it is also an industry, I think we've often treated our kind of more maverick, um, iconic figures quite badly. If you think of somebody like Nicholas Rogue, who's probably my favourite mm -hmm. living filmmaker of all time, director of, co-director of performance, 
uh, Man of to Earth, Eureka, Walkabout, um, countless other, don't look now, mm. countless other masterpieces. You know, he couldn't get a film made for, for a long, long time. Terence Davis, who was here um, yeah. a few weeks ago, you know, Terence Davis week, yeah. famously didn't make a film for 10 years because he, he couldn't get funded. And I think that we, what we find at the moment, we're, we're in a place where as an industry as, and as an art, we're beginning to recognise that there is a, a brand of British filmmaking which is beyond period dramas, which is beyond the social socialist realist tradition, which incorporates quite a big diversity of voices. Now this includes kind of some of the sensualists, and I would count, I would count um, Nicholas Rogue as the greatest British sensualist filmmaker, but it's al it also includes kind of figures from the more artist film background, mm -hmm. Steve McQueen, um, Andrew Cotting. It also includes documentary filmmakers, Asif Kapadia. And I think the other thing that was really important with this book and this collection of filmmakers was that obviously, and it's a bit of a buzzword at the moment and very much a hot topic and rightly so, is the idea of diversity. I mean, mm -hmm. the idea that it shouldn't just be white middle class filmmakers making films, there should be women, there should be people, you know, people from different racial, social, and sexual backgrounds. And I think it was important that the, the book and the people in this book kind of reflected that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are, there are some quite, um, somebody wants to lock up already. There are, there are some, you know, there are some more established figures um, in, in the book, but there are also a lot of first time filmmakers. There's a director in here called Hong Kao who made a film called Lilting, which when we, when we interviewed him. With ben Wishaw. That that's something? right, yeah, and it's a lovely film. Um, and, and, you know, not many people have known that film, we, and we interviewed him before the film had come out. There's a guy called Harry McQueen, which is my favourite interview in the book, because Harry McQueen made a film called Hinterland, which is all of my favourite film things. It's a road movie, it's a debut, um, it's a homage to Radio On. Um, it was a film which was made with no money, no funding, no BFI support, no government support whatsoever. He basically went out, made the film himself, after he'd inherited some money when a relative died, and by doing small acting gigs. Um, you know, and I think that's a real example of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, a filmmaker who's truly independent. And you I think there are other filmmakers mm -hmm. in here that have had benefaction. You know, 12 Years a Slave is a studio film, mm -hmm. um, but it still comes from somebody that came from an artist filmmaking tradition. You, one, one of the things that I, that I like about the book, and obviously I recommend it to many of you who want to pick up on um, what's happening with independent cinema in the UK, is that... Uh, you give, um, you allow the directors to, to talk about some of the processes that they they're involved with as 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 a director, um, and this is something that uh, I noticed that, as you said, when Terence Davis visited here last week, one of the one of the things he he was asked about was uh, how he worked with um, actors, how he sort of um, rehearsed them and got them ready, and so he gave, he, he put a window or a spotlight on um, his particular professional approach to that, which was which was um, quite, quite revealing what he said, you know, which was basically that um, if, um, if the actor said something like, well, you know, the moment wasn't there, mm. you know, when I was performing, he, you know, he would say, uh, well, you know, when you've got, you know, when you're being paid to be in the moment, be in the moment, Behead. you know. Yeah. Um, and it's, um, your book is revealing in that respect because the directors do highlight the types of things that, uh, techniques they use, but also the pressures that, that they face as directors. Um, the only equivalent kinds of approach that I could recall is the, the series of um, books, which I think are called Formations, which were about script writers. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It was, I don't know whether it was Formations, but... Projections. Projections, yeah. yeah. And screenwriters talked almost like the, in the same way about... Um, so I, I, I recommend it for that because it gives real um, directorial sort of information. Yeah. But I've got a th uh, my own particular theory about some of the directors that you cover in this book and why they've been able to emerge now, which is that a group of them, and I would single out um, Claire Bernard, Carol Morley, um, Steve McQueen, possibly Amara Santa, um, uh, Joanna Hogg as well. Um, these, these were directors that were beginning to make um, either... Um, debut features or very interesting short films at, um, uh, at the end of um, the BFI's time, before BFI was closed down and the UK Film Council yeah. came along. And then 
they were they were almost like freeze freeze frozen for about a decade while the UK Film Council was in place, mm. because the kinds of ideas that they had didn't fit the kinds of UK Film Council approach to to making movies. They yeah. had to be, you know, much more generic, much more commercially driven. Uh, and since the BFI has co has come back as almost like the custodian of yeah. British film, they've now got a chance to yeah. blossom and. You know, I, I mean, I don't know whether you agree with that, but I that seemed to me to no, be something. I, that's I mean, I think the BFI them. are quite smart because what the BFI do, um, British Film Institute, is they do, and I think this is a way that a kind of cinema should function, really, in an ideal world. Is every now and again the BFI will fund a film which they know is going to be profitable, but which has value. Um, as an example, Suffragette. Any of you see Suffragette? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought Suffragette was a. I, I probably shouldn't. So, uh, um, okay. Uh, well, Suffragette Don't was made. Don't forget, you're disrespecting one of Man Manchester's yeah. most famous yeah, yeah. female not, politicians. Not the politician. I mean, I, I, I just find Abby Morgan, who wrote mm. The Iron Lady, writing a film. Uh, I, yeah, anyway, we'll draw a veil. But anyway, so the BFI funded Suffragette, which is obviously a really, really important film um, uh, and a terrific piece of filmmaking. Um, <laughs> And, and that is obviously has commercial mm -hmm. prospects. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's got a cast, it's quite sellable, it will go into multiplexes and it will generate income. But what they, they also do on the other hand is they do also then fund films like a film which is going to be coming out later this year called Notes on Blindness, which is two first time filmmakers that have made a film about the process of going blind. Um, it takes the technique which Chloe Bernard used in the Arbor and it's actors speaking the transcripts of, of real people. It's a kind of synthesis between a documentary and a fiction film. And I think that's where the BFI are getting it right. Yeah. You know, that they're, 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 they are funding films which do have commercial value, and they're also funding films which have less commercial value, but which arguably have more cultural value. And, you know, a lot of these films in here, you know, jo Joanna Hogg, Terence Davis is now a, a kind of been a benefactor of the BFI, Asif Kapadia, uh, Peter Strickland. You know, the, the BFI really is kind of supporting these filmmakers in a way that they, they didn't. I mean, I remember when Alan Parker was chairman of the BFI and he found it appalling that people like Peter Greenaway be were, were being given money to make films. Now, when they when you can say that's the chairman of the BFI, I think that's really, really worrying. I mean, I'd rather sit through anything Peter Greenaway makes than I would Alan Parker. Um, hopefully Alan Parker isn't in the audience <laughs> tonight. Um, but I think that what the BFI are London doing, tonight. you know, they, they, they are trying to strike a balance between commercial and cultural, and I think that, that's important. I think they do a good job. I mean, that's one of the discussions that um, came up this morning in um, the MA group that I was talking to, which is this um, tension between the cultural um, imperative and the commercial imperative that happens within public institutions, particularly mm -hmm. as happened with the BFI, and the way that um, pre the Film Council, the BFI, in, in essence, could remain almost um, as, a, as a cultural cinematic body because a film like Distant Voices Still Lives by Terence Davis and I think even The Long Day Closes, they were 100% financed by the BFI. So Terence Davis could go off knowing that uh, he, ha you know, he didn't have to negotiate all the time with three or four other co-producers, but yep. he could just implement his vision. And then when the Film Council came along, um, it was... Uh, you have to have a sales agent in, you know, in cahoots, even at the treatment stage, and then you had to balance lots of different finances coming in. I do, I do agree with you though about the way that now the BFI is trying to, if not ride two horses at once, but um, try to spread out its funding, spread bet in some sense, by keeping um, um, interested talent coming yeah. through. At the same time, uh, it, it not just with Suffragette, but with other more commercially driven films, because it's it's got the mandate for the whole of the film industry, yeah. and it can't just concentrate like the Film Council did on um, chasing the American market and then leaving lots of filmmakers behind. Well, the film the Film Council pretty much ruined the UK film industry for a good five years. Um, you know, it was completely ruinous, and the legacy of that. You know, the BFI had to kind of rescue it, but I mean, the, the, the Film Council w was a was a terrible thing that, that happened. And, uh, you know, quite often, the, you know, these things start off with good intent. People don't 
go out to necessarily, but they, they just made bad decisions. I think that they were making decisions, you know, I've mentioned this idea of the balance. I think when there isn't the balance, and all, all, the, all the film council decisions were made on the side of commerce, and I don't think they had much, I don't think they had, I think they had very little regard for culture. And I think that we have to be very careful. You know, I, I recently listened to the, the um, Brian Eno, John Peel lecture, and he said something which I, I thought was brilliant and which I keep repeating and trying to pass off of my, uh, as my own, is that, you know, w when we have to be careful how we ascribe value to something. And I think that in any kind of cultural practice, we're very quick to assume that something only has value if it's if it has commercial and economic value. If it value. can be monetised. Yeah, and, I, and I, I don't think everything has to be monetised. You know, I, I, I think that just because, you know, uh, uh, Amar Asante's first, first film made less money than Suffragette, that it has less value than, than Way of Suffragette. Way of Life. Way of Life, yeah. You know, I think that we have to be careful not just to monetise everything. And I think that's where the BFI have been a lot smarter than the Film Council, is they realise that a film by Andrew Cotting isn't going to make mm. very much money, but it doesn't mean that it has less value. Of course, there's a system mm. in place where it means they'll spend less releasing it, but I that's kind of I understandable. Think I think there's another way that, that, that um, in recognition of value, that, that say those two institutions differed, because <coughs> I, rem I recall that under the f under the Film Council, Alex Cox, um, um, Liverpool director, Repo Man, Sid and Nancy, etc. He'd started to make some films in, in Liverpool and had some new ideas. And then when he pitched something to the Film Council, he then was asked to go off and do a pilot yeah. for a, a project. Yeah. So the kinds of work that he'd been doing in the indie sector, the values that, that were there, the kinds of experience he'd learned, the kinds of people he worked with, wasn't given a, a sanction. It was considered irrelevant. He had that he had to then shoot a pilot for the film he wanted to do, as, <coughs> as if he was a, no, you know, a novice, an ingenue, except he was you know, experienced in independent cinema. And, um, and that's the kind of um, quite toxic spirit that, was, that yeah. was generated at that time. Whereas I think um, a BFI now is obviously prepared to accept that there are certain um, attributes and characteristics in filmmaking which are valuable in themselves, and you may have generated them by perhaps working you know, in, with a theatre company or coming from the music background. And it just allows independent yeah. cinema to be more flourishing because of that. Well, I think it's interesting. I mean, it goes back to the, you know, the name of the people that you read out in this book. You, you, you do have people not only coming from a, an artist film background, you know, Andrew Cotting, who you mentioned, and, and um, Gideon Koppel, who's somebody else in the book I very much like. You have people also coming from you know, somebody like Jonathan Glazer, who comes from a commercials background? You know there are there are directors in the book that came from a theatre mm -hmm. background, and I think you know that there's a recognition that sometimes, if you come from a different discipline, you can have a new. I mean, I remember when somebody like John Borman made Point Blank. I think the reason that film is so interesting it's an outsider's view of America, and sometimes when you have an outsider's view of cinema, mm -hmm. you know, Orson awesome Welles said you should learn all the rules and then right. disre yeah. disregard yeah. them. I think there is something about not necessarily making films which follow a formula. And I think there, you know, there is this notion that if people are coming from a non-filmmaking background... Uh, and again, I think there's, there's also been a certain democratisation of the filmmaking process, not just because of the advent of digital, and, and, but also the idea that you don't have to go to, mm. to, to yeah. film school. You, know, you, you don't have to have studied film. You can have a natural talent or just an application. You know, somebody like Shane Meadows, who isn't in the book um, because he was probably too much of a veteran mm. figure. You know, Shane Meadows, with all the best will in the world, made films by stealing video cameras and just going out and making mm. films. And sometimes so we, that's... We tell all our students to do the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and sometimes, you know, and sometimes that is a really good way to learn. Mm. Sometimes the only way you can learn is by, is by doing. Mm. Um, but that's the spirit that um, is often associated with the, um, American indie cinema, you know, um, max out your credit card. So I wanted to um, pick up on uh, some of the differences between um, UK independent cinema and American cinema in, in, in your um, uh, mind and eyes, because I'm sure that you've seen and studied lots of um, examples of, um, of American yeah. indie cinema. Um, but one, one thing that occurred to me watching um, the news come in from the Oscars was that um, it, seemed, it seemed to me that 
directors like Lenny Abra Abrahamson, an Irish director, um, can, you know, uh, with a movie that's nominated for Best Film, has come out of the indie sector, I Ireland and the UK, and he's not, um, he's not really out of it yet, he's still part of it. Mm. But um, his film can be nominated for an Oscar. We've got, had um, um, Steve McQueen, we um, also saw Asif Kapadia win an Oscar. So there seems to be something about UK independent film that maybe is different from American because, I, and not that Oscars are any, in any sense a, a, you know, um, a stamp of, mm. of um, excellence in any way, but that American indie cinema seems to be um, so far removed, you know, the Jarmusches, et cetera, from um, what you could call the kinds of recognition that comes through the Oscars, whereas English ind indies, or so you say Irish and British, seem to be able to get closer to that. Well, I think there's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, without, I, I'm not a massive, for me, the Oscars, I don't regard as a kind of any kind of yeah. barometer. Um, but, you know, I think also the fact is, is that, that I guess some of these films are seen as quite exotic. I mean, if you think of a film like Room, have any of you seen Room? Yeah, I mean, um, <coughs> I'm going to be honest, and it's been, I, I think it's Lenny's worst film. Um, you know, that film has much less interest to me. <laughs> it's a film which was made with tremendous intent. Is it, don't get me wrong, it's a very, very well-made film, very good subject, but it's a film with bigger stars in. It's a film set in America. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily saying that he's compromised, but you can imagine that for, for a... Uh, a, a kind of industry that wants to kind of reward, reward mm -hmm. a film, that's a fairly easy film to reward. 12 Years a Slave, I would say, is also a fairly easy film for, for the American Academy to, to reward. Um, when you go back to the American independent films, I wrote a book on American independent cinema, and I think that what, uh, what those, those films were doing, <laughs> they really were kind of quite challenging in terms of their sexual politics, their racial politics, and some of the kind of gender questions mm. that they raised. And I think for that, re for that reason, it was kind of harder to embrace some of those films. But then obviously, you know, what happened was a lot of these films were then funded by studios anyway. Um, so th there really wasn't that much that was independent about them. They kind of, you know, wh what tends to happen is that everything at some stage will be co-opted by the mainstream or the status quo. I remember reading a really good, well, watching a really good interview two Robert Altman stories actually, for the price of one. Robert Altman was once telling this story about, you know, he was making these films and for, 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 for the kind of money makers in the studios, these films were just like rocks. And they were thinking, you know, why has Robert Altman got those rocks? Maybe we should have some of those rocks in our collection. So they started to make, they started to make Robert Altman films and then they hated them. It's like, well, what the, f you know, sorry, I nearly swore. You know, what the hell are we gonna do with these? We, we don't want these kind of rocks. We want the rocks that we had before that make mm -hmm. money. And then the other Robert Altman story I really like is when Robert Altman and David Lynch were both nominated for Best Director Oscar for, it would have been, it was when David Lynch was nominated for The Straight Story. I can't remember what the Robert Altman film was. And there's a very famous piece of footage. It's pre-YouTube, but you can probably see it on YouTube. Neither of them win. I think Ron Howard wins. And Robert Altman turns to David Lynch and says, David, it's better this way. And I think that sums up the situation quite nicely. I think there is always a danger that once something becomes co-opted by the mainstream, in some ways it becomes kind of polluted in, in, in some way. I suppose one big difference between the American indie <coughs> scene and the UK indie scene is that the UK indie scene is, I suppose you could say it's in inverted commas, part sponsored by the state because of the, because my, all of these directors I've mentioned will have been um, supported through the development of their career and the films are mentioned either by the BFI or the Film Council. Yeah, some, some, some were, some, some, some in the book, the but the majority. Yeah, and yeah. the American independent um, sector is, um, in a sense, completely maverickly financed, so it's very different. Yeah. And, so, and there's often, um, I suppose, a recognition that with um, public support, there may be some uh, lack of edge or lack of vibrancy or, or lack of attention to maybe controversy because you're, you're operating within a, a sort of sanctioned system. So mm. there's a difference in that way, yeah. I guess. Um, now, I'm conscious that we've been rabbiting here for 40 minutes or so, so um, no, we, we had some clips ready, but um, we're destined to finish here at half seven, so I'm wondering whether we should just open it up for... I'm happy to do. Well, let's open it up for some 
question. Thank you. Uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, the question, I suppose, I mean, we've spoken about production. Um, it's about distribution. I mentioned exhibition, but the, the middle per bit. Yeah. Distribution, and to what extent that's the real kind of gate that people have to get through. There's a kind of gatekeeping issue here. Because there's plenty of films that are being made, but obviously, as we all know, the vast majority of films never get to their audiences. Um, and that's mainly an issue of distribution, of not getting a distributor, um, or if it does get a distributor, getting very limited release, you know, a, a tiny number of screens, and obviously people not knowing about it, not having the budget to market it and so on. So I, I suppose one question about dis distribution, but also a sort of attached question, which is, I, I guess, about um, the potential for um, people to experience these films in other windows, in other places, particularly, yeah. obviously, the loss of, I mean, Channel 4 used to show a lot more world cinema, a lot more internet, yeah. you know, a lot more experimental films than it currently does. Um, is there a place for video on demand platforms, uh, movie and those kind of things, yeah. to come in there and to actually offer that instead? Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the reasons that a lot of the distributors, well, there's a number of factors here. I mean, distributors started to buy, or arguably started to buy less and less specialised film. Let's use the term specialised to mean foreign language, documentary avant-garde artist film because what used to happen is is when they used to buy these films years ago 10 years ago possibly a bit less they could rely on one of the major broadcasters to buy the film from them so film for um, <coughs> BBC they used to buy quite a high number of, of specialized films and they started to stop they just started to stop buying them so when when some when a distributor was negotiating to buy a film for the UK, it could no longer count on this on this on this on this money. Um, but also because of some of the things that I mentioned at the start, they couldn't even really count on these films getting into cinemas. Um, so you know it was very very risky for them to buy a film which they may not get a TV sale on and which may not play in any cinemas at all. So I think that that's why kind of some of the the, the, the films declined in terms of getting distribution. I think you're absolutely right. I think online does have a really important part to play. I mean, I'm impressed with what Mubi does um, because it's a, a kind of proper curated site. I think the BFI is starting to try and do something similar with iPlayer. And I think that the place for on, 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 on demand isn't just for new films, but I think that the place for on demand is to contribute to a, a culture of cinephilia, which I think that in the UK we are in danger of, of, of losing. Um, you know. As a as a as a an exhibitor or a cinema operator, I think that we have to not be fearful of on demand. I don't think it's going to cannibalise the audiences. I think there will always be people that want to see films in cinemas, rather than seeing them at home on a laptop on a home cinema system. But I think that online certainly does have a big part to play. And if you look at how it's changed in the last three or four years, films now will be released in what's called a multi-platform format. So they'll go into cinemas at the same time as people can download them to their phones or um, home computers, um, and I think that, that that will contribute to the wider film culture, and I think that's the part, you know, I think that's the part that it will play. Um, but I think people have been quite, I mean, I don't know if any of you here read Sight and Sound, any of you Sight and Sound readers? There's been a big debate in the pages of Sight and Sound. Everybody seems quite quick to write off um, the idea of specialised films in, in British cinemas because of the fact that the gatekeepers don't want to allow them, but I think you know, we need to be not too quick to write off the fact that there are still thriving cinema audiences. You know, in the last two months, there's been two foreign language films released, uh, The, Assass the Assassin uh, and Rams, an Icelandic film. And have you seen either of those two films? Very, very good films. They've been huge successes. Mm. So I, I think, you know, th th there is proof Assassin's in the pudding. South Korean or Taiwanese? Taiwanese, Taiwanese, Taiwanese yeah. Film, uh, and Rams is Icelandic, you know. People do want to see these films in, in, in cinemas, and, and I think that what we have to do is to hold our nerve and continue to give well, them to them. I mean, one of, the qu one of the questions I wanted to bring out with you, and um, it's, I think it's prompted by what Phil was saying, was that um, y you're running um, a major um, cinema palace in Manchester, Five Screens, I Five think. Screens, yeah. Home has got. And um, with... Um, the proliferation of platforms with films being available on demand and also with increasing, um, you know, similar platform release, um, s some of the impact of the first release night or kind of like the regional premiere 
it's kind of been it's, dissip it's been dissipated a bit. So I wondered how um, a venue like the one you run is reacting to that, um, and it does seem as though you're reacting in ways which is actually providing a wider um, kind of palette of, of fa cinema yeah. fare rather than it shrinking. Yeah, I mean, I, we're, we're quite lucky. We're, we're obviously a subsidised venue, as, as Rosa. We've got five screens. We play a ma mainly, for want of a better term, again, specialised programme. Um, so I might in one screen have something like The Revenant. How many of you saw The Revenant? Yeah, like it? Good. Um, so, you know, we might have something like The Revenant, which is a film which you could argue is a kind of cultural piece of cinema. Mm -hmm. It's made by Inaritu, Mexican. All right, it's got stars in it. Mm -hmm. It's a studio film, but it has a kind of cultural cachet, a kudos. Kind it's just one. Yeah, yeah, it's won lots of Oscars. It, yeah. And the reality is, is that it also has been kind of garlanded with, with, with praise, critical praise. So people are going to want to come and see that film. So I, I feel I have a responsibility to show it. Now I can be have, a, ha, have people queuing around the block for The Revenant, and then in another screen, I've got a Chris Pettit season. And that's how I think you kind of balance the books. Obviously, there's going to be less people that want to see a Chris Pettit season, but I think it, you know, I think it's just as for me, it's just as rev uh, resonant and just as relevant as as the Revenant. So I think you know, I think what you do have to do, you do have to take a sensible approach. And so every now and again, I pl I'll play a film which I know is going to generate a certain amount of revenue, which allows me to do the other things. What's most pleasing about our venue is we've just done a season of films by Jim Allen, who was a Manchester-based writer, very, very political, working-class writer, best known for working with the producer Tony Garnett, also wrote three Ken Loach movies, Hidden Agenda, um, Land and Freedom, and Raining Stones. Um, and we did a Jim Allen season, I think it's about 15 films, uh, and every single screening sold out, oh, yeah. every single one. So, you know, I think the success of Somewhere Like Home is by proving that there are big audiences mm -hmm. for some of the more, I hate to use the term niche because I think it has a kind of ghettoizing mm -hmm. effect, but that, that there are big audiences for these, I mean, I mean, for these films. I, I, did, I did hear about the success of your um, see, season of that man, the man, Jim Allen, the Manchester writer. Yeah. Um, and it made me wonder whether um, you would be tempted to do the same about um, a, a writer from Lee, which is just a couple of miles down the road, Colin Welland, who died yeah. only last year. Yeah. And, um, and he was part of the same generation of left-leaning writers who came through BBC and then moved on got, and got into films. I mean, uh, I suppose... He, he was in Kez. He, he, was in, he, was a, he was a teacher in Kez, He was a teacher right. in Kez, yeah. Um, and then he um, wrote... Um, Chariots of Fire. Of Fire. But we, won't, we won't hold that against him. No, no, that's... No, maybe you won't screen that, but you might screen the others. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, maybe at some point that's, uh, that's somebody to, to recognise. Well, I mean, the, the other thing that's important about home, um, and I don't want to turn it in, in, into an advertorial, but, you know, we, we are there to showcase cinema, past, present, future, in all of its variety. But we, we are also there yeah. to celebrate Northwest talent. So, you know, I, I show a lot of films by first-time local filmmakers, shorts that I'll put on with. You know, we're doing a premiere of a film on March 18 um, called uh, Tales from the Margins, which is four films made by a Liverpool-based filmmaker called Gavin Whitfield, who's truly independent. I mean, I won't tell you how he finances his films, but he makes Shane Meadows um, <laughs> look like somebody from the right side of the tracks. Um, you know, and he, he's, Mike G Gavin is somebody that's been turned down by every single funding organiser. He's just gone out and he's made these films. They're all about working class life. They're all about people with, um, various challenges in their life. And uh, I think these films are really important to be shown. But I also think that as a, as a venue home that, that has an important place in the Northwest, we are there to showcase filmmakers and writers and actors and cinematographers that have come from the region. So, you know, not just because Jim Allen was a success, we'd always planned January in January 2017, we're gonna do Neville Smith, who wrote oh, Gumshoe. Right, yeah. You know, and there will be a plan every year to have some kind of important celebration of filmmakers and talent, film talent, from the region. You know, Maxim Peak, somebody we work mm -hmm. quite closely with. And I, I think we kind of have a responsibility to, so to do that. So um, that, that gives you um, a, a strong um, educational side, because if, if the access to the public consumption of certain types of, say, UK film, up international film, is declined, um, 
you're, you know, you're in a position to resurrect directors from the past. I'd say if you can find the material to screen again, because yeah. often it may not have been digitised. So there's a strong educational kind of drive there as well now. Yeah, I mean, the challenge that we face, and, you know, let's call a spade a spade, and this came up on the, the Northern Powerhouse, is, is you know, the, the, the media is so fixated on London. And as far as the media is concerned, if something isn't happening in London, it isn't happening. Um, and that's something that I really want to challenge. And, and I think that the best programming, not just cinema, but in, in kind of the arts, is no longer happening in London. It's happening outside of London. And, 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 you know, the battle that I've had since I've been at home is to get the London press to write about the things that we're doing. And it's a battle that we're sl slowly winning. You know, the Jim Allen season was featured in, this, in Sight and Sound and The Guardian. Um, the Chris Pettit season got quite a lot of coverage. The next big season that we're doing at home is, is JG Ballard. And that's going to be in The Guardian Guide this yeah, Saturday yeah. in Sight and Sound. You know, it, it's people beginning to realise, you know, hold on a minute, there is all this stuff happening. And the fact that it isn't in London, and, and I kind of feel guilty saying this, as you can probably tell from my act, sometimes mm. I need a translator when I speak. You know, I'm from London, born and bred in London, and I left London because I couldn't do the kind of curatorial, curatorial work that I wanted to do there. And people are beginning to realise that, that there is this world beyond London, and it is now beginning to be written about and I think that's really important you know when you look at the programming that happens at Bristol at the watershed some of the best programming and th there is cubes. this sorry no cube in Bristol. cubes brilliant it's absolutely brilliant you know and, and showroom Sheffield and Queen's Film mm -hmm. Theatre Belfast and Glasgow Film Theatre Film House Edinburgh there are all of these venues that's doing this great stuff and they've been doing it for 20 30 years and it's never been mentioned now it's beginning to get mentioned and I think uh, I don't want to sound like it, but you know, people in London are, are beginning to think, God, there's some good stuff happening. And people are vis tra people are travelling to us. You know, this Hong Kong crime season that we've gotten at the moment is touring the country, and and you know, and people are travelling to it. I think this is a really good time to be involved in something genuinely radical and genuinely challenging. But I think I, th I mean, with your Chris Pettit season, I think um, you know that you know, remind me what the phrase is in Radio One: the children of. Oh, uh, it's the quote from Kraftwerk. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we, we are the children of Walter von Braun, and and, and it's and a Karl reference Marx. and Karl Marx. Yeah, um, but the um, a season like that would um, recently only be developed and devised by the BFI, in a sense. Yeah, the BFI and have got no interest in it. I mean, but <laughs> now um, a place like home is able to intervene in the in the cultural landscape and create something which yeah. is def definitively from the northwest. Yeah. And almost um, cocking a snoop to to, be, to, the, I, to the London. I love home. cocking a snoop. I mean, that's one of my favourite things is to cock a snoop. You know, and the great thing about, you know, if you do want to, you know, to go back to Brian Eno, it's always good to go back to Brian Eno. If you do want to, if you do want to kind of argue against Eno and say, well, actually, if you're going to do stuff, there have to be people come and see it. And you can think, okay, well, yeah, that's fair enough. The great thing with the stuff like the Chris Pettit, when we showed Radio On last Friday night, we had 80 people in, and. You know, when we showed London Orbital on Sunday, we had 40 people in. And so we're doing stuff which I think has cultural value and people are coming to it, which is given it economic value as well. You know, we're kind of winning both ways. But it isn't just Manchester that's doing this. There are other cities that are doing it as well. And I think that's a really important well, part of the narrative. Well, I think it's important for where we are here at Edgehill University to have good, strong um, links with, with home. And hopefully they'll get as strong as we go along. Um, We've got five minutes or so to pick up on any anyone else that wants to. I'm going to say um, we do something quite similar at the small cinema in Liverpool. I think the small cinema is brilliant. Yeah, we've, yeah. Been, we've been open well almost a year, a year on March the 18th, um, and we do program stuff like uh, we showed the recent uh, documentary on the Black Panthers, yeah. sold out three nights in a row, and now and tonight that's given us leeway to show something about the documentary about the roots of small cinema, yeah. uh, roots of third cinema, sorry, yeah. which maybe two or three people might show up to, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have value. Exactly. I think as long as specialised audiences for film would exist, as long as specialised cinemas are allowed to exist, and I think there's a significant difference between like the Watershed uh, and the Cube, for example, both in the same city, but they're both very they're structured much differently. One's totally, totally non-profit. Yeah. I think as far, insofar as those non-profit spaces are allowed to exist, they will generate because they don't have those market incentives. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're free from all that kind of stuff. But 
there's processes constantly militating against that, you know, trying to shut down those kinds of spaces and the practices that they're sort of built on. I think there's something to be said also for the democratisation of programming. To get loads of people to come to the programming meetings and everyone chucks something in, it becomes a much larger conversation. Well, that, so that's, that's kind of, I mean, one of, the, one of the other things that the BFI has done, which is good, is the BFI has, it hasn't set it up, I was going to say set it up, but it funds a thing called the Film Audience Network. Um, and without wishing to make this put you to sleep. Um, you know, what the Film Audience Network does, it's, it's a kind of network of independent cinemas who have all come together um, and kind of said, OK, well, we think that with our collective might, we can bring films into distribution, we can bring films into cinemas, and we can help cinemas that may ordinarily struggle to get films to get them. And, you know, and it's quite... Um, bracing because it's a genuine sense that a collaborative effort to make sure that audiences and what we have to remember we're all really here to give audiences what they want is that audiences have access to the widest possible range of film culture and this comes back to the point that you made about online it's not just audiences in cinemas it's audiences in in, in general um, and i think that's one of the good things that the bfi uh, has done and you know people can feel that they are part of a wider engagement cinemas like the cube you know, there is a sense that, that, that there is a, a, a big kind of group of people standing up and fighting to make sure that it isn't just Star Wars Force Awakens yeah. on, on every screen. And I think this is why we're, we're in an important moment now. What, what, what we, do, we do need, and I think they are doing this, and I've always done this, I've always said, you know, audiences do have to respond. You know, if you put these things on, you can put one or two things on that nobody comes to. And then it begins to become a little bit depressing. You know, audiences, if they're given the opportunity to grasp this stuff, they do kind of need to grasp it. And I think, you know, I, I genuinely think that they are beginning to do that. I think they've been patronised for a long time. I think they've been ripped off in terms of the prices that people would expect them to pay. And I think they're, th they're now beginning to think, OK, yeah, we're beginning to get our cinema back. And, and I think they feel good about it. But I think one of, one of the interesting things about the development of Home as an organisation is that in the gap between it being the corner house as it was and then it moved into a new space and merged with the University Theatre in Manchester and gained home. A great delight for it, yeah. They had a period where they um, interrogated the notion of what an art centre is. So instead of them looking at the people that worked in the art centre as having the knowledge and programming for other people as if it was a form of patronage you know, yep. to pass on. We know that these directors are the right directors. We know that this theatre piece is the right piece. They, they changed the organisational structure at home so that um, they acknowledged the access that audiences had online and they, they turned the whole idea of the place into being about the audience rather than about the programmers being custodians of knowledge. Yeah, I was and less keen on that idea. And, actually, and no, in that period, but but, it, but in that period, they created a new culture for the organisation, which I, I think is one of the reasons it's been able to lift off in the way that it has done. But also I think the pricing is, I mean, you know, if, you, if you're showing a film about working class issues and people from, you know, underprivileged backgrounds and then you're charging them £15 to come and see it, there's, there's a massive chasm there. So we, we were, you know, we worked very hard to make sure that we had a pricing structure which we felt was affordable and, and you know that's another reason why I think that people are are responding and 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 also we want to show films that represent you know we, we, we we're in a, a in a kind of community and there are different you know a community is made up of very very different people and and, and all different kinds of people and if you're only programming I mean I, I, the thing I would hate and even even though I am one I, I would hate home to just be for white liberal guardian mm. readers because that to me there's no point just appealing to those so when I put a film on like Girlhood did any of you see Girlhood? I mean Girlhood's a great film I don't just want white middle class mm. guardian readers I want young black kids to come yeah. and see it because that's their lives on screen and the way you do that is by going into communities and ex explaining that these films are there and they exist making the venue feel approachable so that people don't come up to it and think oh this looks a bit mm. exclusive I, I don't think this is for me but also making it affordable so that they can actually afford to come there and if you do those things then I think y you've, you've got a chance. I'm going to pull this to an end shortly because uh, well we were destined to finish at half seven and also 
because um, Jason's got to drive back to Manchester um, in what might be horrible weather outside. So unless someone's got a question that they're dying to ask, um, and no one's made put their hands up, I'd just like to thank Jason for his really interesting comments about um, independent cinema in the UK distribution exhibition, and also for um, introducing us to uh, what home is like. As well. It's a good yeah. place. I mean, so if you get a chance to, we'll we'll do a field trip. Do a field trip. Yeah, come and come and check it out. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, you know, thank you for for having me here. Well, so one of my um, and you mentioned you had five screens to fill. <laughs> I'm sure you'll chat.